to gather here in your name. And we ask that you would give us the gift of your Holy Spirit this evening uh, to uh, open our hearts and minds to hear what you would have to say to us. Lord, bless uh, Lisa and myself as we share that uh, what we speak uh, will be your words. We ask for your blessing upon uh, our parish, upon all of the uh, ministries and work that you want to do here. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, well, uh, welcome. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Tom Ponchak, uh, the Associate Director of Adult and Young Adult Formation, and I want to thank you for coming out. This is my wife, Lisa. And uh, our hope for this evening is just to kind of share our story, uh, our journey uh, with the Lord, and uh, not just to talk about ourselves, but hopefully uh, as we do that, uh, we'll be able to just kind of in, uh, encourage you and, and uh, uh, build you up as well and, and uh, hopefully impart uh, you know, some faith to you and some encouragement and, and you'll learn uh, some, from some of the mistakes we've made and, and uh, the things that we've done. So that's kind of our hope and our, our goal for this evening. Um, we've been married for 20, well, it'll be 28 years on the 22nd. Next week. Yeah. So next weekend. Um, and we have six kids. These are the, the kiddos. We'll be talking about them so you can see who they are. Um, so Anna is our oldest. Uh, she's currently living with us. She moved up here in December and got a job in campus ministry at Garen Catholic High School. Uh, Mary and then uh, and Mary lives in uh, Florida in Orlando. She's a preschool teacher. And then Claire is uh, 15. Lily is... 12, soon to be 13. Uh, Sarah is 11 and Isaac is eight. And that's him all dressed up for his first communion a couple weeks ago. So uh, that's the fam. Um, and uh, so as we're talking, you have an idea who, who these kids are that we're mentioning. Um, so I just want what we want to do is kind of share our story. So I'm going to start just um, a little bit about myself. I am originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Go Steelers, um, and uh, I believe black and gold. Grew up in a very uh, uh, loving uh, Catholic family. Uh, we took our faith uh, seriously. My parents, uh, I just remember as a child, you know, we always prayed at bedtime together. Uh, we always went to mass together. My dad was you know, parish council president and a Eucharistic minister and a lector and a catechist. And um, I went to Catholic grade school uh, up through eighth grade uh, and so we just you know we had a, a had a pretty good solid upbringing the, the faith was always present in our home um, but I would say just my experience of that growing up as a child uh, and I think it's probably true for anyone that you know it's 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 your parents faith for a long time right and it's it's you kind of inhabit that as you're growing up in the house but uh, it wasn't until I was really in high school uh, ninth grade was uh, confirmation year, and so I went on a retreat uh, with my as part of confirmation prep. And it was on that retreat that I really first heard someone talk about the fact that I could have a relationship with God, I had a relationship with with Jesus and with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That they um, that they were real, they were personal. That wasn't just like kind of God's up there, and I you know I. I'm good, and one day maybe I'll get to heaven sort of thing, but, but he wanted to be involved in my life. And so uh, it was uh, December 7th, 1985. I can remember the day uh, at uh, this uh, church camp uh, that we were using for our retreat. And uh, that evening is when I, you know, I prayed, and I, I just really had this encounter with, with Jesus, with his presence, and asking him to be a part of my life. Um, and that just kind of changed everything. You know, it, it became, uh, the faith became something more than just kind of going through the motions. Uh, prayer became something that was alive. The scripture, scriptures became alive. And, um, and so that kind of got me on this path of, uh, well, you know, this is real and I, I really want to kind of pursue this. Um, and 
to that end, uh, when I was a senior in high school, I applied to uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville. And I'm going to stop there because that's where I met Lisa, so we'll let you get caught up on that. <laughs> okay, so to let you know a little bit about myself, um, I'm originally from Jefferson City, Missouri. When I was 11, my parents moved to Louisiana, and then when I was 15, we moved to South Florida. And um, my family's Catholic, so I grew up Catholic, and we went to Mass every Sunday. But God was never talked about in our home, and we never prayed together. So I kind of, uh, my view of God was that he was distant, and, you know, he created us, and but then he just kind of left us on our own. And when I was 18, I actually stopped believing in God. And I remember having this thought, like, if there was a God, he should be big enough to be able to speak to me, and I don't hear him speaking to me. Therefore, he must not exist. And that sent me on a terrible path. Um, stopped going to church, got involved in the party scene, fell into a, just a lot of despair. I remember just having a lot of despair because if you don't feel like, you know, if you don't believe there's a God, you know, life just had no meaning. And um, all my friends at that time, a lot of them did drugs, but that's something I was always scared to do. I'm like, I'm not doing drugs. But one night I decided, ah, uh, what the heck, you know, not a big deal. I'll give it a try. My friends and I ended up in this not so good area of town, a rough neighborhood. And next thing I know, our car, we had to come to a stop on the road. There were these big guys that surrounded our car and several of them had guns and they were pointing their guns into the car and yelling at us, saying, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. And my life, needless to say, flashed before my eyes. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, they're gonna kill us, they're gonna bury us somewhere, and my family won't even know what happened to me. And um, amazingly, we ended up driving out of that situation. They let us go. But that's kind of where I start, when I started seeking. <laughs> like, what is life all about? You know, is there a God? Is there a heaven and a hell? Um, if I had died, where would I have gone? And um, at the same time, my parents started going to a new church in South Florida. It actually was a charismatic Catholic church, and they had come home just like so excited and so joyful, and, and they kept asking me to go. I'm like, you guys are weird. I'm not going. And, uh, but they just kept, kept asking me, and so finally after a couple weeks, I thought, what do I have to lose? So I went with them, and it was definitely different than anything I had experienced before. They had like really lively music, and everyone kept smiling at me. <laughs> and, um, but what really, what really struck me um, what really impacted me was um, during the consecration of the Eucharist. And suddenly it's like my eyes were open for the first time and I realized that that was Jesus. And I didn't know that as Catholics that's what we believed. And, um, but I, I knew that that was him. And I, I felt his love for me and I felt his forgiveness. And I just started crying. And I knew that that's the love I had been seeking after. That's the love I've I was always looking for, and I said yes to him, and I, and I um, did away with my old lifestyle, and I decided to follow him. I mean, I went all in, and uh, after that, I mean, I, I learned that he does speak to us. You know, it, it's not just us talking in the air, and, but he desires a two-way relationship with us. You know, we can speak to him, and we can hear him speaking to us, and so that's really something I'm very passionate about is helping people understand that, that he wants that two-way relationship and, and we can hear him speaking, speak to us and that doesn't make us weird. Um, so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so she ended up at Steubenville as well. Um, and it's funny because uh, while we were there, I, I, I initially chose uh, Franciscan University because I was discerning the priesthood uh, as a high school senior, college freshman went on some vocation retreats, um, and uh, Steubenville at the time had a pre-theologate program uh, for men that were interested in that. So I was kind of hang hanging out with those guys. I got myself a spiritual director, one of the friars on campus. And uh, over the course of uh, about a year of prayer and meeting with the spiritual director, uh, discerned that that wasn't... Uh, th where the Lord was calling me, I was being called to, to marriage. And it's funny because Lisa at the same time uh, was discerning a call to religious life. She was visiting some convents, and uh, but um, I'll let her tell that story in a second. But, um, you know, when I was at Steubenville, I, I studied theology. 
Um, there was a new professor that came my sophomore year, uh, this guy named Scott Hahn, uh, who became my advisor and uh, got really involved in a lot of ministries on campus. Um, we did uh, Franciscan Youth Ministries, what, which was kind of like a net sort of thing, if you're familiar with net. It, uh, students at the university would form teams and then go to local parishes and put on retreats uh, for high school, for the youth groups at the high schools and things like that. I was involved in uh, leadership for uh, the Life and the Spirit seminars that they ran on campus for their um, festivals of praise they did every month. Uh, just kind of dove uh, all in on that. And, um, but like I said, you know, I, I, I just discerned that's not where the priesthood wasn't where God was calling me, so I, uh, I needed to find myself a wife at Steubenville. Um, and, um, and so that's kind of um, where uh, Lisa and I met. We met, we have conflicting versions of when we met. Um, I remember meeting her uh, in the cafeteria. We were both student workers in the cafeteria. You remember meeting me at, at, a, youth ministry, at a youth yeah. ministry, at the Franciscan youth ministry thing. Um, but we met. So that's the important thing, right? We were friends first. Yeah, we were friends for a while. Um, and then we started uh, dating. We got engaged. Um, oh, you want to share about that? Okay. Well, you're supposed to stop there. <laughs> um, so like I said, you know, one thing I'm very passionate about is, is um, uh, making it known that God still speaks today, that he's alive and he still speaks. So I am, throughout this talk, going to share some ways that he's spoken to me over my life. And that's not to say, look at me. Yeah, That's... Um, to just convey how he wants to speak to all of us, you know, how he desires to speak to all of us. And there are many different ways he speaks. So, um, yeah, like Tom said, okay, so I was discerning religious life at Franciscan University. and But I just didn't have peace about it. And one day I was in the, in the chapel, and I'm like, God, but I need you in the flesh. And I heard him say, what about marriage? And then I saw a vision of a wedding ring. And it was an unusual, or an engagement ring, I, and it was unusual looking. And um, so when um, Tom proposed to me, he didn't have a ring at that time. It was spontaneous. It was fun. Yeah, he wasn't planning on it at that time, but I made him this awesome dinner. It was, it was <laughs> Valentine's Day. And I was sitting there, and I was just thinking to myself, if I don't propose now, I'm just a chump. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I, but I wasn't prepared. Yeah. <laughs> So his, his family lived only about 45 minutes from campus. So after he proposed to me like that next weekend, we went to see his parents. And his mom, um, she mentioned that she had these rings that uh, she had never, they never used them, and we could have them if we wanted. It was her engagement ring, but then when they got married, they got different bands, and she just. Yeah, and so, yes, yeah, they were never being used. And, if we want, and she brought it out, and it was the exact um, ring that I had a vision of and see there's a, like these little triangles on the side I in the vision I was like that's odd you know but she brought it out. I'm like oh you know that's the ring I saw so um, and then another thing that happened when when we were engaged um, in prayer one day I saw myself in this hospital room and I saw these big hands come down from heaven and hand me a baby boy okay so I got pregnant on my honeymoon naturally we thought that was going to be that baby boy. They even told us. They even told us. That I had an ultrasound. They Anna said, was a boy. Yeah, no. that our oldest was. No. We, she was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, now your turn. Oh, Let's see. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah, so, um, so we got married a, a week after graduation. Um, and I just kind of, you know, I felt like this burden, you know, I'm the man. I've got a the husband now. I have to provide for my family. And, and so I, I had throwing out some resumes, and the first job that came along uh, was doing youth ministry uh, in Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., in the Gaithersburg, Rockville uh, area. And so we moved there, and we moved there, um, you know, right after we had gotten married. Uh, we had no friends or family in the area. Uh, I think the closest were my parents, like four and a half hours away, um, and just kind of jumped right into, you know, doing this youth ministry job. And and found that it, it wasn't a great fit um, at the parish itself. Um, it's just the area. We didn't really care for the area as well. And when, 
like Lisa mentioned, um, we were pregnant on our honeymoon, um, and that was not well received uh, by the people at the parish. You know, we even had uh, folks come up to us, why weren't you using contraception? Um, and so we didn't really feel a, a lot of support in that way. And um, we, Lisa developed some complications uh, with the pregnancy and had to be on bed rest. And we were in and out of the hospital every weekend for like a month. Um, and during that whole time, like no one reached out to us. There was, there was, no, there was no meal train. None of the priests came to, the, to see us. We just kind of felt completely alone. Um, and so that year was coming to an end, and we were like, you know what? This is just not a good fit. We need to, we need to get out of here. You didn't feel comfortable renewing your contract. No, it, it so. had just different philosophies. Um, the again, I I had this desire to kind of give students my experience um, in in youth group of having this personal encounter with Jesus, and the the attitude um, that was prevalent uh, among the staff and among the, the people were just, hey, yeah, just do a bunch of fun stuff. Don't, don't get all religious with the kids. And, and so didn't feel comfortable renewing. We didn't really feel comfortable there anyway. And so uh, the Lord provided uh, a job. I, I told them I wasn't coming back. Not knowing where we Didn't have a job lined up. Um, our fallback was moving to Missouri and living in her grandmother's basement. Um, but fortunately, the Lord provides, and uh, I got a job in Kalamazoo, Michigan, teaching religion at a Catholic high school there. And that was uh, just a great experience. I loved teaching. I loved working with the youth. Uh, but again, we were still kind of struggling with the parishes. We, we tried out a couple different parishes in town um, and just had a hard time finding any kind of community, finding uh, people that took their faith uh, seriously. And there was some frustration again with, with ministry. Again, I, in addition to teaching, I was helping out with a youth group at our parish. I was on their um, advisory council. And again, I, I remember literally sitting in a room with other parents, and the, the, the comment came up of, look, the kids are going to walk away from the faith when they go to college anyway. So let's just do a lot of like open gym and things like that. And, uh, you know, when they're getting married or when they want to have a baby, they'll think, hey, I remember youth group was fun. Let's go back to the Catholic Church. That was their master plan for evangelization. Um, and I, I just really had a hard time with that. And um, we had an incident, I had this incident when I was teaching. I taught freshmen and sophomores. And every day I would stand kind of at a podium like this to begin my class. And we'd just kind of go around the room. Okay, what are your prayer intentions? And, you know, kids would raise their hand, like, I'm going to pray for my test next period. I'm going to pray for my dog who's sick or grandmother or whatever it happened to be. Um, but one day, like, we had a, a cheerleader in our classroom, uh, and she had sprained her, her knee. It was in a, a little brace and kind of swollen, discolored and stuff, and she wanted to pray for her knee. So uh, at the time, I was teaching scripture. We were in Acts of the Apostles. And so... She said that, a bunch of other people threw their prayers in. I just kind of said a prayer up here at the beginning. We prayed for God to heal her and for the test and everything else and went on with class. Well, the next day, she comes back into my classroom, jumping up and down, no, no brace on her knee. The swelling was gone. The discoloration was gone. She was complete, her knee was healed. And she's like, Mr. Pontiac, Mr. Pontiac. I'm like, well, what? This is cool. I mean, this is great, but we've been talking about this, right? I mean, we're doing Acts of the Apostles. This is what the, we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray and expect God to answer our prayers. And, um, and so it was great. Um, in the classroom next to me was my college roommate. I got him a job there, too. That same week, he had something similar happen. A football player uh, was in, had been injured, and he prayed for him, and he was healed as well. The following week, we were called down to the, the two of us were called to the chancery office to meet with the vicar general to explain why we're healing people in our classrooms. <laughs> um, and, you know, my response was like, I didn't, I didn't heal anyone. I prayed. God answered. answered. <laughs> um, but he was like, well, you know, parents are complaining. It's freaking people out. You really shouldn't be doing that in your classroom. And I'm thinking, what, what are we doing? Um, 
Says, if you want to do something after school, do something after school. So we started like this after school prayer group for kids, and they would always, you know, it was packed. They would come and, and get prayer. But again, it was just kind of like this, this growing frustration we had with not finding community, um, frustration with not being able to really kind of do the ministry we felt God was calling us to do. And so that is kind of what moved us in the direction of leaving the church. And we, it wasn't intentional. Um, we started, uh, we, we had re- reached out to a non-denominational church in town called uh, The Vineyard. Uh, they're a so- nationwide association of independent evangelical churches. And uh, we reached out to them just to say, hey, you know, we're not looking to leave the, the church, but we're looking for some community. And they had like midweek small groups. And so we asked, if we, can we join a midweek small group without joining your church? And they're like, yeah, sure. So we started going to a um, small group during the week. And over the course of about, I don't know, eight to ten months, um, we just kind of found ourselves more involved uh, with the community, the vineyard. We, re- we had such support, uh, such encouragement um, that we finally just kind of decided, I think it was Easter 1997, um, we switched and uh, I didn't want to cause any kind of big scandal with, with my position so I finished out the school year said I'm not coming back um, it wasn't that unusual and Catholic school teachers don't get paid a ton, a ton to begin with so there's always turnover didn't really give a reason just said I didn't, you know pursuing something else and and we joined the vineyard um, yeah. You're good. I keep going okay <laughs> so uh, so we, we started getting involved with the vineyard there in Michigan, did a lot of work with their youth and young adults, and an opportunity came up to do a, an internship, a pastoral internship at a vineyard in Clearwater, Florida. And so we kind of threw a fleece out there again to the Lord. We're like, okay, we'll do this. If, we want, if you want us to do this, we have to sell our house. And we put it on the for sale by owner actually and it sold three weeks in three weeks um didn't really do any marketing just had a sign up there and someone came by and made us an offer um so we uh we sold everything we had that couldn't fit into a 12 foot tow behind u-haul trailer and moved to clearwater florida with no job no housing two kids uh two kids anna and mary um just kind of trusting in the lord okay lord you're calling us. We're going to do this. And um, we got there. I think you, you stayed with your parents uh, in Fort Lauderdale for about a month or so. I stayed with a family uh, at the church there. We eventually, I eventually got a job. I had started working in insurance, doing uh, claims, auto claims. And uh, so I got a job down there. And Lisa and the kids moved back over. And we got involved with the Clearwater Vineyard. I was a pastoral intern there, so I got to do some preaching. We started a midweek service uh, for young adults. Um, and we after introduced them to Lent. <laughs> inter- yeah, we introduced them to Lent. <laughs> we introduced them to a Good Friday service and read the Passion, and they thought, wow, this is a lot of scripture. Um, yeah, go figure. And, uh, and it was great, you know. And finally, they, they gave us the kind of the commission to uh, go forth and plant our own church. So we did the church planting thing. We moved from Clearwater to Lakeland, which is halfway between Tampa and Orlando, spring training home of the Detroit Tigers, if anyone's a fan. And uh, we started Matthew's House Vineyard. And uh, you know, some pictures to show from that. Um, we did a house church model. It was our intention to be kind of an, a a model where we would attract people that were turned off by traditional church. And so um, you could see us kind of meeting, and this was our home on Easter Sunday one day, one year. Um, and we were meeting at someone else's home here. This is, we would start, we'd meet on Sunday evenings. We'd start off with uh, our, our church service. And, and then afterwards we'd have a meal, we share a meal with a uh, like potluck. And, uh, and so that was all kind of, well and good, we did that for a few years. Um, and the community bu- we built was really tight. I mean, I, it was just, it was great. We came together, we pitched in to, to help one another. Someone's air conditioning went out. We all pulled our money together to pay for that. Um, 
a new mom moved in down the street. We pulled money together and bought her a crib and some furniture. It was kind of like, you know, Acts of the Apostles talks about there's no need among them, right? That they just kind of pulled their resources together. And that's kind of what we were doing. Um, and we would do communion every week. Uh, and that was kind of, for the people that were in our church, that meant a lot to them. They, they, they were really getting something out of that. Uh, for Lisa and I, it was kind of just a reminder that this, this is nice, but it's not Jesus. Um, and then we got pregnant with Claire, uh, our third non-boy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I want her to be baptized. And that wasn't really, infant baptism wasn't really a thing that you did in evangelical churches. Uh, but I'm my own pope because it's my church. <laughs> And so I decided, you know what, uh, I did a three-week teaching series on baptism. We went and looked at the church fathers. We looked at scripture. And that's me baptizing Claire. Um, I baptized another baby at that same uh, service. And that was kind of, I think, the turning point for us is realizing that, okay, we're just kind of reinventing the wheel. Because when we had our church, uh, Matthew's house, we did... We were doing liturgical seasons. We did Liturgy of the Hours. Um, I took my Sunday readings from the lectionary because it's just too hard to come up with stuff on your own. Um, and we just kind of realized, well, we're just kind of reinventing the wheel. What, what, what are we doing? You know, we, obviously, we miss the sacraments. We miss the Eucharist. And so um, after some time, we decided, you know, we need to go back uh, to the Catholic Church. And we, we stepped down. Uh, several people from our community went through um, our CIA. One family became Orthodox. Uh, so we had this impact on them. And one of them said, you've ruined us for being evangelical um, <laughs> because we did so many so much liturgical things yeah. and his, church history. And, um, and so that's kind of what really brought us back to the church was that hunger for the Eucharist. Um, and we learned, you know, some lessons in there. I think for myself, and I don't think Lisa, you didn't really struggle with this as much, but I know for me for a long time, I struggled with like regret, like, oh, I blew it. What did I do? Why did I take this detour? Um, but God really kind of did a work in me, kind of healing me of that and showing me that, yeah, that probably wasn't the ideal thing to do, to leave the church and, and do that. But at the same time, um, he's able to work with our mistakes. He's able to work with the path that we choose. And, and we, I think we learned some valuable lessons that we probably wouldn't have learned um, if we had just stayed where we were. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think some of those things that you know, for myself was the value of community and uh, small groups and, and really getting to know one another. Again, just kind of putting these slides together for, to, for tonight and uh, looking at some of the other pictures from our Matthews house time. I was like, oh, I kind of miss... I miss some of that, you know, just that, that tightness we had. Um, the other part of it, too, is just, you know, enjoy church. Like, I know for so many Catholics, we just, we kind of get in the motion where we come, and, and especially probably pre-COVID, you know, we were just, we're coming out of habit, we're coming out of obligation for so many people. And, you know, it's a race to get out of the church and get into the parking lot and get to where you're going when mass is over. Um, but, you know, this idea of just kind of just in, oh, enjoy that community. Smile at other people, you know. Go over and introduce yourself and uh, just have that openness and that, that desire to uh, share your life with, with others. You want to share some lessons? Yeah, I mean, there were some things I definitely learned, too. Um, and I wouldn't recommend this. But <laughs> I, I mean, for me, I felt like... Um, when we left the Catholic Church and joined the Vineyard, then Jesus was all we had, and, and we clung to Jesus. And, I mean, the Catholic Church has so many, it's so rich, and there's so many beautiful things, and there's the saints and, and you know, all these things. Um, but they need to be built on the, on the solid rock of Jesus. So I think, it, for me, it was good to have all that stripped away and uh, for the Lord to uh, redo my foundation on just him, you know. And then when we came back, then all these other things could be built on top of that. Does that make sense? Um, and um, so that's one, one thing I think I got out of it. 
another is just the Lord really taught me how to be instead of do. I think Tom and I, for so long, we were, we were so focused on doing. And, you know, we were so, as soon as we got out of Franciscan University, you know, we're so anxious to, to start doing ministry. You know, we wanted to do ministry. And, and the Lord just really taught me how to find my identity and my worth in being before doing. And one way he did that is, um, um, let's see, after, after Mary was born, I really um, um, had a flare-up of an auto, autoimmune condition I have. So I um, experienced severe muscle weakness and fatigue. And, and so, like, it was hard for me to even take care of my kids, to even get off the couch. And uh, so I just remember lying on the couch one day. You know, I, I gated off the room so my kids could play and they wouldn't get hurt and I just lied on the couch and I couldn't do anything so I just decided to just meditate on the Lord I might, might as well make good use of this time and and so I just meditated on the Lord and when I did that three images came to my mind one was of a spider one was of a grasshopper and one was of a bee and I felt like the Lord asked me which of these would you rather be like and I thought about it for a while and I thought well let's see grasshoppers they don't really contribute much to, to society. You know, they just, um, they destroy crops. Um, spiders contribute something. You know, they eat pesky insects. But then a bee, well, it really does something good. You know, it produces something good for society. So I told the Lord, well, I want to be like a bee. And he said, uh, bees lie dormant for a time. I didn't realize that about bees. And so I did some research, and I found out, sure enough, the baby larvae bees they lie down in the honeycomb until they're mature enough to come out and make honey. <laughs> so that kind of began my journey of just the Lord teaching me just to be, you know, get it? And, um, and just to um, be still and know that he's God and to find my worth and just uh, being his daughter, being his beloved daughter, that that's most important, you know, to, um, that we find our worth in, in being his child first and foremost. Um, also, I learned that when God promises something, it doesn't always happen right away. <laughs> okay, so I told you the story of I saw these hands come down from heaven and hand me a baby boy before we even had any of our girls. Well, it wasn't for, until 20 years later and five girls later that we, the Lord pro finally blessed us with a boy. <laughs> you know? And it's not that you know, I didn't feel like I needed a boy. I, I would have been totally fine with all girls, but the Lord promised me. You know, he promised me. He was going to give me a boy. So I wanted to see it come to be fulfilled, you know. But um, so it took some perseverance, though, and, and, um, and some believing. And he, he, he almost gave up. <laughs> he goes, after girl like, number honey, five. Honey, are you sure it wasn't just, like, metaphorical? <laughs> yeah, after girl number five, he's like, maybe it was just symbolic. I'm like, no, I know what I saw. I know. So, but yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, it's your turn. So, um, so like I said, you know, during that time from when we left the Catholic Church, um, and even while I was the pastor at Matthew's house, and um, I was what they call bivocational, uh, earning my living uh, doing insurance claims uh, while uh, doing ministry on the side. And when we came back to the Catholic Church, um, yeah, I, we were really blessed. I think one of the things that uh, we realized it seemed like there was a, I don't know whether it was the parishes we went to or just in general, that there was just kind of a shift within the church. Um, that there was more open. Am I stealing your thunder on that? No, no, no. Okay. I was just turning it. Uh, that there was like, there was more emphasis on community. Um, there was mm -hmm. more intentionality in ministry. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that helped. Mm -hmm. Um the parish we came back to had just started a young adult uh, ministry. Uh, they called it De Fide, and we got involved. I think it was, it was like the we missed their first meeting, the second meeting we were in, and we were in for good. It got to the point where they, they kind of joked that the <laughs> age range was 18 to the Ponchaks. Um, we weren't technically young adults, but yeah. they made us feel at home. So. Um, but it was, you know, it was, uh, it was just this great experience. And and that kind of stirred, in, and, and again, that, that whole time God's working on me uh, in that, that 
that regret and, and everything that I, I, you know, I, that feeling like God had a plan for my life and I did something else. And now, you know, I've kind of blown it. And, I, and I, so I went through a lot of that, just kind of that feeling of, oh, I've blown it. You know, yeah, God still loves me. And, and she would try to talk me out of it, you know, my little funks every now and then. And um, she would like, she would come up with like, you know, scripture, you know, it's like, well, you know, think about Moses, you know, Moses made mistakes. I'm like, yeah, and he didn't enter the promised land. <laughs> and she's like, well, what about David? And I'm like, yeah, that baby died. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, so I just had this, like, this, this mindset of like, well, there was, God had something planned for me. And it didn't help that like, um, the same time that I had left Steuben, Steubenville, um, if I had, if, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was stay and just get my master's right then and there. And if I had done that, you know, I would have, I'm looking at like, well, who would I have had been in class with? And the, the, the guys that were in, you know, my range for getting, it would have been there, like Dr. Ed Sri, Chris Stefanik, uh, you, you name uh, uh, Curtis Martin, who started Focus, uh, and I, I kind of knew Curtis a little bit at the time, but I was like, man, if I had stuck around, you know, what could God have done, you know, with look at all of these things, these connections and everything that came out. And, and so, you know, so I, it took a long time, I think, for God to kind of work some of that out of me um, as I'm just kind of working a, you know, regular job. And, and it's funny, we were in Clearwater and we moved to Lakeland. And the plan when we went to plant our church was, well, I'll just get a new job in Lakeland. Um, but I couldn't find one. Um, and so the company I was working with, Mercury Auto Insurance, um, not only could I not find something good in Lakeland, but they kept promoting me. Um, and so I went from like an adjuster to a supervisor to an assistant manager. And so it kind of like, well, I was making a, my commute was 54 miles from my house to the office. Um, I did that for 12 years, <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, but it was during that time, you know, it, it kind of it, it stripped me down of a lot of st things because I couldn't do a lot just because of that commute. You know, I couldn't get involved in a lot of things. But what I was getting involved with, it was, it was life-giving. Um, but God was kind of working on me. And, and it finally got to the point where, like, you know, I really want to get back into doing full-time ministry. And so God, how, you know, we're going to leave it up to you. We're going to submit. This is, this is the idea. This is the, I feel like you're calling us to this. And, um, and we looked, we were kind of hoping to stay in Florida um, and find something. By this time, you know, our two older girls, Anna and Mary, were in, uh, in college at University of Central Florida in Orlando. And, um, but nothing was working out job-wise. And so finally, we, we sat down and we're like, okay. We, we looked map. at the map and we're like, how far north do we want to go? Are we willing to go? And like, Indiana? All right, we'll go to Indiana. That's like as far north as we'll look for a job. Um, and lo and behold, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the Lord opened a, a door for me to get a, a position as Director of Adult Faith Formation at Our Lady of Mount Carmel um, about five years ago this summer. And even then, just that, that process of moving, um, God had to work you know, we're, we're trusting him, we're working, and we're relying on him. Our house um, had issues. We had, we found out after the fact that there was a septic system. Oh, and the septic tank was under the concrete uh, patio for the pool. Yeah, um, really close With no to access. The pool. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's nice. Uh, we had this laminate flooring all through the house. Uh, but it was an older laminate flooring, and in one of the rooms, some of it had gotten worn down with a chair that was there, and we needed to replace a couple pieces, and they didn't make it anymore. And like, what are we going to do? I mean, we can't afford to, like, do the entire house again. And so we were praying, we're like, God, you got to provide, you got to provide. And Yeah, I went in the pantry one day, and there were three boards. Sitting on the floor. Exactly what we needed, and we have no idea. I mean, they weren't, we never saw them before. Oh. So. Um, and 
the septic thing. We're like, well, we got to have someone come out and find this thing. And, and we had the septic company come out, and they just kind of, they're like, well, we think it might be here. We're going to have to bust up the concrete. And the one spot they picked was right over the access panel uh, for the tank. Uh, so they didn't have tank. to bust it all And up, it was yeah. just within enough distance away from the pool that it was still within wasn't violating code so it could stay there we didn't have to move things so it's like god just kind of worked out all these like these little details i think it shows us that god cares about those little things you know we could trust him I mean, a lot of times it's like we think we gotta give god these big things but sometimes it's just the little things we need to to turn to him too um and then uh so um we, we got up here and we're working uh, i'm working at our lady and in 2019 um actually it's 2018 I had like a this lump on my arm, a little lump. And I went to my doctor and he looked at it, he's like, ah, I think that's a lipoma. It's like a benign cyst. Don't worry about it. I'm like, okay. And it kept getting a little bit bigger and went back to the doctor. He's like, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's anything to worry about with it. I'm like, okay. Um, it got a little bit bigger. And finally he was like, well, okay, it let's start to hurt. It started, yeah, it started to hurt, yeah. and it was a little bit bigger. He's like, okay, we'll, we'll set you up with a, for an MRI. And uh, in April of 2019, that lipoma was diagnosed as a sarcoma, uh, cancer, um, and it had gotten to, I don't know, grapefruit size? Mm -hmm. um, it was a very rare on, form of Yeah, it's pleomorphic liposarcoma. Um, only a few cases in a million um, diagnosed every year and uh, so I felt lucky me um, and so I was like wow you know I, I, I remember getting that news and going up I was at work when they called me and went upstairs and uh, praying and came home and told Lisa and um, like okay well God we're just gonna have to trust in you you know and and we believe I mean we we, we really believe that God heals we prayed with people like I said I shared that story and we've prayed with other people and seen healings take place. And that, and I just kind of got in this place where I'm like, you know what? This is going to be really cool because I'm going to get healed. And everyone, everyone has seen like this mass on my arm. And then it's not going to be there. And God's going to get all this glory. And it's going to be awesome. And, um, and I even I traveled up to Michigan to see some friends, had them pray with me, went out to Steubenville for a conference and got some prayer there. And um, didn't disappear. Um, but what did happen? Um, well, and you went through chemo. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I had to start. I had to do three rounds of chemo in the summer of 2019. Uh, in August, uh, had surgery to have it removed. Uh, so I, I, I joke it's my shark bite. I'm missing a good chunk of my tricep there. So don't ask me to do push-ups. Um, had to do radiation after that. Uh, so it was kind of like April through really December of dealing with, uh, with all of that. And, but what God worked, it, what God did show me in that, even though, you know, I was like, oh, God, this is going to be awesome for you to, get, you know, heal me and it's going to be this quick thing. And, um, but what he did show me and what really just kind of like got cemented into my heart um, was that God is good. And his goodness is not dependent on my circumstances. It's dependent on who he is. Like, he's good regardless of what's going on in my life. And because he's good, I could take whatever's going on in my life and trust him with it. And that was like, that was a, just a, the biggest lesson that I think that the Lord was teaching me through that was tr know that I am good, know that you can trust me, um, and if I can trust him, then I can let go of the anxiety about it. I can let go of the worry um, and just surrender. And, it's, and I can surrender because I know that he's good. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, like he said, I mean, I was believing, too, that we were going to receive this miracle. And I would pray over you almost every other night. Mm -hmm. I would lay hands on him and pray you, and we'd have faith. And you know, thank you, God, that you're going to heal him. And, um, and he, 
I mean, he is cancer free. So, so far. Yeah. So, um, you know, God did work, just not the way that we thought he was going to, you know. And uh, but reflecting back, um, like I've seen I've seen miracles. I've seen people healed of cancer and all this. And um, I don't know what saint it is. I, I'm not sure what saint. Deacon, maybe you know um, <laughs> um, that we're only as virtuous as we are in the worst of situations. Have you heard that quote? Is it St. Catherine of Siena? Or? It might be. Yeah, I'm not sure. I heard this quote once, but I'm not sure of the saint. But that we're only as virtuous as we are in the worst of situations. And I, I'd say that's what we saw in this situation. I, I think sometimes when you're going through hard things, it can bring to the surface what's hidden in our hearts, you know, when we're going through hard things. I think we see that now with, like, everything with COVID and stuff. Like, things are surfacing in people's hearts, you know. And that I think that definitely happened. I mean, we saw, you know, I mean, just the stress of that, I think, brought some stuff up in our in our hearts, you know, we saw some impatience and some, um, you know, is that because of that fear, you know, all this stuff. I wasn't a good patient, apparently. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it, me and the kids kind of wanted to disappear at times, <laughs> you know, let him have his face because um, he wasn't always pleasant to be around. But um, I, I'd say that situation just... Um, he was able to give it to the Lord, and because he gave it to the Lord, the Lord was able to purify and refine, kind of like, you know, gold that's tested in the fire. It goes in the fire, and all the dross comes to the surface, and then it's skimmed off, and it becomes even more beautiful um, than if it hadn't have gone in the fire. And so I'd say that's what happened in this situation. So I think more came out of this, more good came out of this because he wasn't miraculously healed than if he had been just a lot more virtue and um mm -hmm. yeah we're i think we're all better yeah for you know in the whole family yeah and I, I, our daughter anna surprised us yeah. we, were, we came back from a chemo session my first chemo session um in the summer and we pulled into our driveway and there's a car sitting in there with a florida license plate she had worked it out with her job she was working at Panera at the time and she worked it out to have the summer off and drove up uh, by herself to stay with us to help out um, and uh, wanted, and kind of surprised us with that so it was kind of it brought out a lot I think in in the family in general yeah and uh, so that anyway that brings us to um, current current day and we're currently going through I, I a really hard season we've been going through a really hard season with a couple of our kids they've been sick one of them for a year and a half one of them since January just a lot of mystery involved lots of doctors haven't been able to find what's going on so it's been like for me as a mom it's been even harder than him having cancer you know just because you know as a as a parent you know you you um, it's hard not knowing what's going on with your kid and you want to fix it, you know, and you can't fix it all the time, you know. So that's very difficult. So it's been just really difficult. So the Lord has brought me to new levels of surrender, you know, new levels of surrender. And um, But what what I've really been, there was once uh, years ago, and I won't, I don't need to go into the details of the situation, but it was another extremely hard situation. That Had I nothing was, to do with me. Had nothing to do with him. It was a it was another situation, and uh, it, it was a very hard season in my life. And at that time, I was like, "God, just give me a nice leisurely life." You know, <laughs> that's what I want. And the Lord left me alone. He really did. I didn't feel His presence. I didn't hear Him speaking to me, and I was absolutely miserable. So with this hard season, total opposite. You know, I'm like, I realize that um, it's it's a lot better to have a hard life with God than a nice leisurely life without him, you know? And, um, yeah, I think that's. So, um, so coming here to St. Alphonsus, um, again, I was at Our Lady Mount Carmel, um, and uh, we were uh, last year, spring of last year, uh, in addition to, uh, my work at Our Lady at Mount Carmel, 
uh, we had applied for, there's a uh, ministry that we are that we had been kind of been friends with, I guess, um, since 2018 called Encounter Ministries. Uh, they're up in uh, Michigan. They're the ones I went up when I had cancer to go up and, and get prayer. And, um, and they do these schools of ministries, uh, training people. And so we applied in uh, spring of 2020 uh, to have a campus here in the Indianapolis area and were accepted. And that was a process of meeting with the bishop, uh, Bishop Doherty, and, and getting his approval and his sign off and, and things. And our plan was, you know, this is, you know, we're going to do this in, in addition to my work at Our Lady. And uh, then this January with the United Heart program um, going on, they decided to do some reorganization, restructuring at the parish level. And my position as director of adult faith formation was eliminated. Um, and so we were like, oh, what are we going to do? Um, you know, in addition to, like she mentioned, kids having a couple kids with health issues. And now we're like, I don't know, a job, health insurance. We're taking, <laughs> taking these kids to a lot of doctors. And, and, um, and, but we really felt committed to the area, to, to Indy, because we still had this commitment to encounter. And we felt like, no, we really, we're supposed to be here. We're really supposed to be here. And, um, and so it was, uh, it was, I think it was two days after uh, I was told my position was being eliminated that I found out the position here had opened and applied and uh, had a great uh, interview and uh, time talking with, with Deacon. And uh, I'm so happy to, to be here and uh, to just kind of make this almost like a seamless transition, really. I mean, not having to move, staying within the diocese. Um, I was able to start here basically a week after my position ended there so i got like a little mini vacation in between but um i'm really looking forward to and really excited about the opportunities here uh with saint alphonsus working with both adults and young adults um obviously you've probably heard through our story there's a lot of young adult stuff in there um and so that's really you know have a heart for for young adults and young adult ministry but also for adult ministry um so, you know, my vision, my goal um, is to really kind of work with you and work with the parish to, to help all of us kind of grow as being disciples of Jesus. I know I've grown in, uh, I, in doing ministry. I grow when I meet with people and uh, hear their stories and walk with them on the, the faith journey. Um, so offering Bible studies and um, small groups and just kind of one-on-one -on -one encounters those are all the things that um that i'm very much invested in very uh looking forward to getting started uh we mentioned that uh at the masses that uh, we have a summer book club coming up um using the book be healed by bob shoots it talks about kind of like holistic approach holistic healing and body mind um spirit um it's a great book and uh, we're doing it virtually kind of for covid more because it's summer and people travel we're in and out uh, so this way you don't have to worry about oh i really wanted to do that but i'm not going to be gone a week well you could still zoom in from virginia beach or wherever you happen to be um, and so we're kind of doing that uh, for the summer and then kicking a lot of stuff off in the fall working with rcia and uh, i'm going to do a bible study on the gospel of mark beginning in september uh, to give you just a, a little glimpse a sneak peek at that and so we're really excited, uh, and I know Lisa uh, is uh, going to be a part of things as well. Um, so we're excited to get to know all of you and and to to do ministry here. So that's our story. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. Why don't we just, uh, close with a, a quick prayer? Um, asking for Our Lady's intercession for um, all that she uh, wants to, to see happen here uh, at St. Alphonsus to, to bring the parish and the community to her son. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of okay. grace, the Lord, the Lord is with thee. Me. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners 
and now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone.